May we start now, Professor? Okay. So welcome back everyone to the second special lecture of this series. I hope you all enjoyed uh, Dr. Ayran's first insightful lecture on Sri Lanka's economic crisis and unraveling global order. Today we have with us Dr. Ayran again to take forward this discussion. And today he will be speaking on debt restructuring, austerity and the IMF trap in Sri Lanka. The structure of today's talk will be the same as the previous one. Dr. Ayalan will speak initially for about 75 to 80 minutes, and after that, we will have a discussion session. And we welcome you all to actively participate in the discussion session with your comments and questions. So let's begin the lecture by giving a warm welcome to Dr. Ayalan. Thank you, sir, for joining. Over to you. Um, thank you, uh, Ankur. And um, once again, uh, many thanks to the uh, Ideas Network for inviting me uh, to give these uh, two lectures. I also really enjoyed um, the discussion after uh, the first lecture uh, two days ago. And again, I think this is a really great initiative by the Ideas Network, uh, particularly to take forward this um, advanced certificate course on uh, research in political economy. Um, so in, in today's lecture, uh, which is titled Debt Restructuring, Austerity, and the IMF uh, Trap in Sri Lanka, um, I'm going to first start by uh, just recapping a few points from uh, the last uh, lecture, um, which was uh, much more broadly on the uh, the lead up to the economic crisis. And in today's lecture, I'm going to be looking at the current dynamics, uh, particularly in, in relation to debt restructuring, the policies that the, the government is uh, taking forward, and um, provocatively what I'm calling the IMF uh, trap. Um, I think uh, later today, uh, a think tank in the United States, uh, in New York, is going to be publishing uh, a paper uh, co-authored by Delka uh, Gunawardana, Niantini Kadirgama, and myself, uh, titled The uh, IMF Trap. And um, for this lecture, I'm drawing uh, considerably from uh, that uh, article that we uh, that is just to be uh, published. Um, so in recapping what I said uh, during the last lecture, uh, Sri Lanka uh, for all purposes is now going through an economic depression, a depression on the scale of uh, how uh, countries around the world were affected during the 1930s the Great Depression, with uh, last year a 10% contraction of our economy and uh, likely to see a similar contraction this year in 2023 as well. While um, I showed that the crisis was long in the making, uh, a historical uh, crisis with uh, many structural issues, uh, in Sri Lanka today and in the mainstream media, uh, the uh, crisis in Sri Lanka uh, is characterized, including by the Sri Lankan economic establishment, uh, as mainly one of just corruption and mismanagement, rather than looking at the structural factors uh, and the historical factors that have led to this deep crisis. And for me, the historical and uh, structural nature of this crisis is important for us to understand uh, because it's going to take that long to also get out of this uh, crisis. And, and, and many of the solutions that are proposed, if they continue in that same 
uh, historical and political economic vein, then we won't be able to get out of this crisis and it's going to be uh, even longer drawn out. Um, so in, in, in that sense, um, uh, it is the neoliberal path of development over the last uh, four and a half decades in Sri Lanka that uh, led to this uh, crisis. And the solution, the neoliberal solution to this crisis that they are proposing is tremendous wage repression and a fire sale of assets uh, leading to growth to a race to the bottom. In other words, a race to the bottom with other developing countries where while uh, the working people in our countries are completely devastated and their wages brought to the very minimum, uh, there is the hope that growth will resume uh, along with accumulation for capital. Um, so I think uh, those were the points that I put forward in my last lecture. If you look at uh, contemporary Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka over the, the last two years, uh, as we descended into this crisis, all eyes are on the IMF. Uh, in Sri Lanka, in, in the mainstream discussion, and, and to a large extent in the, in the Western and international media as well, um, the uh, IMF agreement is seen as the solution, as if it is a magic bullet that's going to uh, solve the crisis of Sri Lanka. Uh, there's already an IMF staff agreement that, uh, that was agreed to uh, on September 1st, 2022, uh, exactly six months ago. Um, but the IMF then came out and said the staff agreement of uh, 2.9 billion uh, US dollars, which would be dispersed over a period of four years, uh, the funds themselves will only be dispersed if Sri Lanka uh, follows two major conditions. But before we get to those conditions, it, it's useful to put this US dollars, 2.9 billion over four years in context. Over 48 months, 2.9 billion US dollars nearly amounts to 60 million US dollars per month on the average. Whereas Sri Lanka's foreign earnings today are 1,500 million USD per month, right? So it's uh, less than about, it's about 4% of our monthly uh, foreign earnings. So this is certainly not uh, going to solve the problem, um, but they claim that with this IMF agreement, Sri Lanka would have access to uh, financing from multilateral organizations like the World Bank and ADP. Uh, but even that will just amount to a couple billion US dollars per year. So again, uh, not significant in relation to Sri Lanka's foreign earnings. And bilateral donors and, and Sri Lanka having uh, defaulted on bilateral debt and our, and our biggest bilateral donors are Japan and uh, China and to a lesser extent, uh, India, they are likely to uh, lend anytime soon uh, given that Sri Lanka has uh, just defaulted on their debt. And uh, market borrowings, I, I mentioned last time that in terms of Sri Lanka's foreign debt, the structure has changed where market borrowings are on the order of 53% bill, uh, 53%. Um, international sovereign bonds of our total foreign debt is about 40%. Uh, 
uh, market borrowings for a number of years are unlikely because uh, of the extremely high spreads that um, Sri Lanka would have to uh, pay. In other words, the extremely high interest rates Sri Lanka would have to pay probably on the order of uh, 20 or even 30, 40% uh, is not feasible anytime soon. So in that context, um, the kind of policies that are taken forward for this 2.9 billion US dollars um, from the IMF uh, have to be put uh, in financial context. Now, to get those 2.9 billion US dollars from the IMF over the next four years and to uh, move forward on this agreement, the two conditions that IMF has put forward are one, uh, debt restructuring commitments from all of Sri Lanka's uh, creditors. And that has been on hold for various reasons, including because Sri Lanka is caught in the geopolitics of China versus the West, where the West wants to uh, go after China using the case of Sri Lanka. And, and, and Sri Lanka is only one of tens of countries that China has lent to and, and to make it a precedent where a large amount of Chinese debt uh, would have to be uh, restructured, including with a haircut, meaning that uh, the amount of capital that is to be repaid would be reduced. And uh, China doesn't uh, want to go in that direction. And it is uh, pointing to uh, other factors such as the exemption of multilateral donors, which I will have much to say about later in my lecture. Um, and the problems with debt restructuring are also reflective of a broader debt crisis affecting the global South without a global program for debt relief. So while debt restructuring commitments from the creditors is uh, a demand put forward by IMF to Sri Lanka, uh, globally, uh, Sri Lanka is caught in a situation of geopolitics and the lack of a global program to be able to move forward. In a sense, it is beyond uh, Sri Lanka's control in terms of addressing uh, this demand. The second demand put forward by the IMF uh, to release its funds is that Sri Lanka should be on the path towards a primary surplus by 2025. That's you know, within two years, and um, which is completely unrealistic. Uh, Sri Lanka's primary deficit was 5.7% in 2021. It was estimated and likely to be uh, further uh, raised downward, a deficit of 4% in 2022. And amidst this huge crisis where the economy is contracting, where uh, businesses are defaulting, where incomes are collapsing, to be able to get revenue high enough towards a primary surplus is next to impossible. What that has meant is extreme austerity, leading to devastation of uh, the economic lives of uh, people. But that is what the IMF is insisting. And that is what the current Sri Lankan government is uh, implementing. And uh, this has been uh, a very, uh, it's going to be a very difficult situation going forward and unlikely uh, to be sustained in um, the months ahead, as we are seeing with uh, increasing protests on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Now, if I, to put the IMF in historical uh, context, um, this is Sri Lanka's 
17th IMF agreement since 1965. So when um, the economic establishment in Sri Lanka talks as if uh, this is a, the IMF agreement is uh, the magic uh, bullet, uh, I think we should uh, put it in context that this is in their view should be the 17th uh, magic bullet. And if the 16 before them have failed, why is this 17th one? Uh, going to work. Now, not all IMF agreements were as um, uh, significant. Uh, perhaps uh, prior to this IMF agreement, the more significant ones were in 1977 and 1978, as I mentioned in my lecture uh, last time, that it was during that period that Sri Lanka went through structural adjustment. Um, leading to um, what are called open economy uh, reforms and um, or the, the neoliberal path of uh, development, which in many ways has led to the current crisis. The most recent ones, the 15th, uh, IMF agreement was a standby arrangement in July 2009. Uh, Sri Lanka civil war ended uh, in May 2009. And a few months later, uh, Sri Lanka got this uh, standby arrangement um, of 2.6 billion US dollars, which gave the green light for Sri Lanka to go and float international sovereign bonds on a large scale, a huge inflow of uh, capital. Uh, remember, this is the time of the global financial crisis uh, where uh, there was a lot of capital from the metropolis in the West flowing to emerging markets. And Sri Lanka was not really seen as an emerging market, uh, but a, uh, post-war economy capable of high growth. And, uh, but that IMF agreement uh, was critical in giving the green light for global capital uh, to flood uh, Sri Lanka, leading to a bubble of uh, economic growth when Sri Lanka was considered uh, the darling of uh, development with uh, high rates of uh, GDP growth uh, on the order of eight, nine uh, percent, but uh, which I have argued was really a second wave of neoliberalism, uh, a bubble uh, that a few years later uh, burst as uh, the uh, uh, euphoria about uh, the Rajapaksa regime that had um, brutally won the civil war and carried out supposedly development led to even a regime change just five years later in the elections of uh, January 2015. But that uh, change did not make any difference as uh, the regime of uh, President Sirisena and Prime Minister Rani Vikramasinghe uh, Prime Minister Ayan Vikramasinghe, as all of you know, was recently appointed as president of Sri Lanka by the parliament, even though he did not even win his own parliamentary seat in the last parliamentary elections of 2019. He was appointed president after President Gotabaya Rajapaksa uh, fled the country amidst mounting protests in July last year. Uh, that regime of the Sri Sena Vikramasinghe uh, regime when uh, at that time Prime Minister Bikram Singh was very much the driving seat of the economy went for Sri Lanka's 16th IMF agreement, an extended fund facility of 1.5 billion US dollars. So in June 2016, uh, an IMF agreement of US dollars 1.5 billion. And the next month in July, 2016, 
Sri Lanka went ahead and floated an equal amount, 1.5 billion US dollars in international sovereign bonds. So there is a clear correlation between these IMF agreements and mounting debt in countries like Sri Lanka. And these are commercial borrowing um, where uh, <clears throat> international sovereign bonds um, usually of uh, 10 year terms, sometimes five year terms, but in the case of Sri Lanka with an average of about 7.5% interest. These are dollar denominated bonds at 7.5% interest. When remember, uh, Western interest rates after the global financial crisis have remained near 0%. Uh, so that huge premium amounts to tremendous extraction. If you do the compound interest math of uh, a 10 year bond at 7.5%, percent, it amounts to uh, the principal being equal to the interest being paid during that 10 year period. So um, this is what has led to uh, the tremendous unsustainable debt crisis of Sri Lanka over the last uh, 12, 15 years with um, mounting debt, paying huge levels of interest that were not sustainable. And I think I've said enough last time about um, the other pressures that came to bear on uh, accelerating the crisis, such as the COVID uh, disruptions, the war, in uh, Ukraine, but um, the neoliberal path and the kind of development financing model with which <clears throat> countries like Sri Lanka were working with uh, were definitely unsustainable. Uh, and now we are looking at not just Sri Lanka, uh, according to the UNDP, 52 countries uh, in the global south who are facing the possibility of default or severe uh, debt crisis. Now in response uh, to this mounting uh, crisis, on April 12th, 2022, uh, Sri Lanka announced that it was uh, defaulting on its external debt. Uh, particularly its bilateral debt and uh, its external commercial debt. It did say that it's not defaulting on its multilateral debt, in other words, debt owed to uh, the World Bank uh, and um, the Asian Development Bank, which are two big domes of Sri Lanka. Now, I have... Uh, characterize this default at that particular moment as a premature default. Um, and I think this is an important point uh, to consider, and I'm gonna take some time to explain why I call it a premature default. By October, 2021, as Sri Lanka's uh, foreign reserves were uh, declining, there was a mounting campaign by the economic establishment, starting with uh, many of the neoliberal uh, think tanks in uh, Sri Lanka, to name them, uh, for example, Verite Research, uh, the Advocata uh, think tank. Um, they uh, took the lead in calling for on Sri Lanka to what they call preemptively uh, default on its external debt. And that uh, mounting call by January was also taken up by uh, the Sri Lankan opposition in parliament, including uh, the main opposition, 
uh, led by uh, Sajid uh, Premadasa uh, and the SJB, uh, as well as other parties uh, like the Tamil National Alliance. Uh, in the face of a, um, um, not only a fall in foreign uh, reserves, but also concerns about shortages, uh, including food, uh, medicine, and uh, energy. They said Sri Lanka should default on its debt and pay for those uh, essential goods. So that was their argument. What they did not mention at all was the need to prioritize our imports. Because Sri Lanka uh, in 2021 had the highest import bill in its history. So we were in a deep economic crisis where we could not, uh, where our foreign reserves were falling. But it was also the year where Sri Lanka had its highest import bill. Uh, this irony somehow was lost uh, in the, in the uh, campaign of these uh, neoliberal think tanks and the uh, economic establishment who called for uh, on the government to default on its external debt. Now there's a politics behind uh, this call for a default. They assumed that once Sri Lanka defaults on its external debt, it would be forced to immediately accept the conditions of the IMF and go to the IMF for an IMF agreement. They assumed that debt restructuring would be a simple and quick process and that there would be bridge financing coming from various donors uh, until as such time as Sri Lanka is able to normalize its external uh, finances. So this uh, campaign by the economic establishment followed by uh, the political establishment is what led to what I call a premature default on 12th April 2022, when in the month of April, Sri Lanka only had to make debt servicing of 78 million US dollars. That very month in April 2022, Sri Lanka's import bill was 1,300 million US dollars. The next major debt repayment was three and a half months later on 25th July 2022 for a 1 billion US dollar sovereign bond. So first, why did they default three and a half months early? And why did they not prioritize imports, giving priority to food, medicine, fuel, and intermediate goods necessary for production and exports? Why does that not follow? The, for the, the latter point, the simple answer is that the neoliberal uh, commitment to free trade is so strong that they were willing to default on their. Um, they were willing to default on their. Uh, they were willing to default on their external uh, debt, rather than. Um, consider prioritizing their imports. So this uh, situation, I think we have to uh, 
look at uh, very carefully because um, the consequence is that their assumptions were all wrong. Um, the IMF agreement, 10 months later or almost a year later, uh, has still not been achieved. There was, has been no additional uh, bridge financing. And debt restructuring looks like is going to take uh, many years into the future. So this kind of a uh, situation uh, has to be uh, looked into in Sri Lanka because it's only in Sri Lanka that when the country defaulted for the first time in its post-colonial history, first time in 74 years that the Sri Lankan elite and our economic establishment were euphoric that Sri Lanka had defaulted on its debt. The consequence, of course, is that now the working people in Sri Lanka are being forced to deal with tremendous austerity, um, uh, devastation with huge contraction of the economy, a depression as I've uh, characterized it. And uh, the responsibility uh, falls uh, squarely on the policymakers who took, took that decision, advised by supposedly global advisors who pushed Sri Lanka to take that disastrous uh, decision. What more has happened with that is that Sri Lanka is completely at the mercy of the International Monetary Fund and its creditors with no bargaining power having defaulted. They did not prepare, even using those last three and a half months, even though they could have, in my view, prolonged it much longer if they had started prioritizing imports earlier by having adequate finances to be able to negotiate with greater bargaining power with both the IMF and other international uh, actors. Late last year, the State Minister of Finance came out and said that in the last quarter of 2022, Sri Lanka was able to save US dollars 1.2 billion by prioritizing imports. So once they defaulted and there was no IMF agreement, there was no bridge financing and debt restructuring was prolonged, they took further steps towards prioritizing imports and saving 1.2 billion US dollars in one quarter. If that was done over four quarters last year, they could have saved if in fact the state minister of finance is correct, which I think the data to me shows that. We would have saved something like 5 billion US dollars in uh, foreign exchange. So why was this not considered earlier? And I think this is something that we have to consider that trade liberalization, the commitment to the free trade regime and the debt crisis are deeply interlinked, but that is hardly discussed internationally or nationally in Sri Lanka when thinking about debt crisis. In other words, the global South is pushed to import goods, often on extremely unfavorable terms, as I mentioned in my last lecture, in terms of what has happened to the terms of trade for the global South you know, throughout a post-colonial period with successive neo-colonial regimes. And that has then pushed debt crisis. And debt crisis has led to conditions by the IMF and World Bank 
towards further trade liberalization and capital account convertibility, pushing us into cycles of debt crises. Now I come to the topic, the demands, the two major demands of uh, the IMF, uh, a demand for a primary uh, surplus by 2025. Uh, now, uh, the IMF says that if Sri Lanka is to qualify for the IMF agreement, it should have a uh, primary surplus by 2025. In other words, the primary surplus is basically that Sri Lanka's revenue should be higher than its expenditure and expenditure excluding debt uh, servicing. Um, and the huge difficulty of it, as I mentioned earlier, where Sri Lanka's um, primary deficit of 5.7% in 2021 uh, estimates that the government is providing that a 4% deficit last year. It's extremely unlikely when the economy is in free fall that we can achieve primary surplus by 2025, but the government is implementing severe austerity measures. Government expenditure has been brought to a more or less a halt. Uh, they're trying to increase taxes when the cost of living has already greatly increased, as I mentioned in my last lecture, with inflation on the order of 60%, real incomes have fallen by 40%, but they're still trying to increase uh, tax revenue to meet these uh, IMF uh, conditionality of primary surplus. And a number of uh, economists, uh, including uh, Peter Nolan, who's a former IMF official, uh, in an article uh, late last year, uh, looking at the IMF's debt sustainability analysis and its demand that Sri Lanka achieve uh, primary surplus, uh, Sry Lanka and Zambia achieve primary surplus by 2025-2026 has been very critical saying that even Sri Lanka's best performing peers, whether it's uh, Vietnam, Thailand, India, uh, they all have an average of 1.5% to 2% primary deficit. So why force a primary surplus on a country like Sri Lanka, but it's going through such a devastating crisis. Unless of course the IMF's only interest is to satisfy the concerns of the creditors. And, and, and that seems to be uh, the IMF's main agenda uh, to satisfy the uh, interests of the creditors to the detriment of the interests of uh, the people of Sri Lanka. Now, this kind of demand for fiscal consolidation is uh, a huge conflation of the twin deficits. They want us to address the fiscal deficit, but without considering what's happening in terms of the current account deficit. So even if we get uh, a primary surplus or even a fiscal surplus, how are we going to ensure that the, the current account deficit, in other words, uh, foreign uh, expenditure minus the uh, foreign earnings, which led to this crisis in the first place, is addressed? Because there's no clear policy, either on the part of the IMF or the Sri Lankan government, to address our current account deficit going forward. So the trade liberalization regime is assumed to continue. Our imports will continue to be high. So even if we get a fiscal surplus in terms of our rupee account, the dollar crisis is not going to be addressed. We may have short-term inflow of uh, capital, 
but there's still going to be that deficit, which is going to eventually lead to another crisis. The only thing uh, that our economic establishment has is the, is the same mantra we've heard over the last four decades, that we will somehow increase our exports, that the export-led model is the only way forward. But that's proven to be a failure, and there's absolutely no reason it's going to succeed now, particularly in a time where global trade growth has, is low. This is not the hyper-globalization decade of the 1990s when global trade growth was almost triple global GDP growth. Then the pie was increasing, the global trade pie was increasing where uh, countries like the East Asian uh, countries could uh, export their way forward. Now, with the shrinking pie, Sri Lanka is forced into a further race to the bottom with other countries. In other words, this model will only work for some countries, not going to work for all countries. But much of the global south is now having to take this race uh, to the bottom, even as they are forced into uh, a similar model where they continue to uh, decrease wages through wage repression and compete for the shrinking export uh, pie. And that is seems to be the, the only strategy of capital and global capital is, is severe wage repression uh, in the global south, including uh, Sri Lanka. Um, and it's become, it's going to be a dog eat dog race to the bottom where, you know, you know Sri Lanka's wages be lower than Bangladesh to be able to outcompete Bangladesh with the, the garment sector, uh, for example, regardless of uh, what that means for social welfare or the well being of our people. So there's a logic to this uh, primary uh, surplus. Uh, argument, which is tremendous wage repression, and of course, dismantling of uh, social welfare in Sri Lanka through um, the uh, a fire sale and privatization of our social infrastructure built over decades, whether it's the Ceylon Electricity Board, as I mentioned uh, last time, um, which uh, where Sri Lanka almost 99% of our population has um, connectivity to the electricity grid. Now they have uh, increased electricity charges by almost threefold for large sections of the population, making electricity unaffordable, but making it a prospect for privatization. Or Sri Lanka has had free education all the way up to university. All our universities are state universities. That privatization of universities and higher education, education more generally, is not out of reach with this kind of a regime to be able to create uh, or to generate this primary surplus. The second demand of the IMF. The first demand, as I mentioned, was uh, primary surplus by 2025 is uh, debt restructuring. But such debt restructuring is uh, going to be, uh, is also being held hostage by, uh, bought by many bondholders and voucher funds. As I mentioned, Sri Lanka's external debt, 53% of it is commercial borrowing. And whether those bondholders will be willing towards a large haircut remains in question. Already one of those bondholders, the Hamilton, Hamilton Reserve Bank, has uh, sued Sri Lanka in, in New York. And with Sri Lanka, much of its exports are going to the Western world um, will uh, can be caught in this sort of quagmire of uh, legal action uh, going forward. 
in reality, they should, we should be pushing for the bondholders to take a huge haircut, in, in, if not outright debt cancellation. For the reason that I mentioned that Sri Lanka's um, interest rates for many of these bonds were on the average of 7.5%. And in 10 years, um, their interest earnings are equivalent to the principal. So they've made a killing and now they want to make a further killing uh, by holding out and uh, extracting more, even as uh, Sri Lanka has defaulted. The mechanisms to address uh, debt restructuring are limited. Uh, the Paris Club, which mainly consists of uh, Western countries, but if you look at Sri Lanka's external debt, the debt to Western countries are very minimal, except that, uh, except for, of course, uh, Japan, which is part of uh, the Paris Club. And, and Japan is a significant actor with 10% of Sri Lanka's external debt. But the Western countries, uh, many of whom now channel much of their uh, development financing through the multilateral agencies, particularly the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. And, um, and what the Western countries insist is that multilateral debt cannot be restructured. So their contributions uh, will not go through any kind of debt restructuring. And that is also one reason why uh, China is holding out and uh, the grand statements of the Paris Club carry little water um, when uh, they are not, the Western countries themselves are not willing uh, to hold their bondholders, much of Sri Lanka's debt is to the Western world as in the, in the form of uh, debt floated in, in the Western capital markets. Um, the other structures uh, that were developed towards debt restructuring, there is the, the G20 uh, common framework, though that was that is uh, in theory only qualifies for low-income countries. Uh, Sri Lanka, as I mentioned in the, in the early 2010s, when it went through its second wave of neoliberalism and a bubble of uh, infrastructure spending with capital inflows and its per capita GDP uh, increased, where Sri Lanka was categorized as a middle-income uh, country. Uh, does not even qualify for the G20 common framework. But even those countries that do qualify for the G20 common framework, as we've seen, for example, Zambia and so on, uh, have had uh, a little recourse, a little meaningful recourse. And the recent uh, meeting of uh, the G20 uh, finance ministers and the IMF in uh, Bangalore uh, last week, um, led to very little uh, progress in terms of uh, addressing the uh, debt problems that so many countries in the global south, as I mentioned, the UNDP uh, claims 52 countries are in danger of uh, default and uh, debt uh, crisis. So there's no global mechanism, uh, feasible global mechanism to address uh, the debt problems that countries like Sri Lanka are facing. But instead, what we see is a geopolitical tussle, a geopolitical game where the, the Western actors are only interested in trying to label the debt trap in countries like Sri Lanka as a Chinese debt trap. While in fact, Chinese debt uh, Sri Lanka's debt to China is only on the order of between 10 and 20 percent, uh, depending on whether you look at uh, direct state debt or, or debt owed to state-owned enterprises and so on. Whereas commercial borrowing, which is mainly from uh, the Western capital markets, amounts to uh, 52 percent of Sri Lanka's external debt. So the West is only interested in uh, taking forward their geopolitical interests in uh, Sri Lanka. And by the West, I also mean India. Um, and they are playing this game while uh, Sri Lanka suffers. 
And uh, China is holding out, pointing out to the fact that multilateral debt is not being restructured and it's unreal unrealistic to demand that China alone take so much of the uh, haircut or the kind of the loss in capital. And uh, the IMF itself is not a neutral party. It is also a lender and an arbitrator in this process of debt restructuring by uh, putting forward its debt sustainability uh, analysis and definitely geopolitics it will also determine what the IMF uh, decides to do with the United States being uh, the largest stakeholder in the decision-making of the uh, IMF. So in this uh, context, the debt overhang and the debt problems that Sri Lanka and much of the global South are facing is pointing to a lost decade, much like the decade in the 1980s with the debt crisis, possibly much worse, definitely uh, for Sri Lanka with uh, this kind of debt. So as opposed to the rhetoric in the Western uh, media, uh, I characterize uh, this um, crisis as not one of a Chinese debt trap, but one of an IMF trap that Sri Lanka is caught in. Um, and as I mentioned um, uh, later today, uh, a think tank based in New York Phenomenal World is uh, publishing an article uh, co-authored by uh, uh, two of my comrades and myself, uh, Devaka Gunavadana and Anthony Kadugama, titled The IMF Trap, where we uh, outline uh, the crisis in, you know, the, in Sri Lanka and, and, and the current moment as one uh, of an IMF trap. Uh, because countries like Sri Lanka, and, and Sri Lanka, as I mentioned, had uh, subject itself to a premature default, its economic establishment and its elite pushing for a default, uh, but nevertheless now realizing that they are in a precarious position uh, that in terms of trying to normalize the external relations. Once you default, all kinds of uh, additional costs from insurance, from uh, costs of importing goods, contracts, uh, international financial uh, transactions, all of that, uh, and the huge amount of rent seeking by different actors leads, aggravates that uh, the, the situation. So there's a need for Sri Lanka to somehow normalize its external finances through a process of uh, debt restructuring. And Sri Lanka at the same time cannot also ignore the West, its largest trading partner, and, and particularly when it comes to exports, uh, close to 67, 70% of our exports are to the West, to Europe, and the United States uh, being the largest trading partners. And the European Union uh, continues to come and tell Sri Lanka, do not restrict your imports, that remain committed to the free trade uh, regime. That message has been coming loud and clear from the European Union to Sri Lanka. While Sri Lanka suffocates under debt crisis and hardly being able to uh, import essential goods. So in this kind of context, Sri Lanka is being pushed and certainly our current president and the economic establishment are happy and ready to move on a fire sale of Sri Lanka's most uh, cherished assets, whether it's the Ceylon Electricity Board, the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation, um, as they've been pushed also to the mercy of geopolitical interests. So there's a section within Sri Lanka that is ready to sell the family silver to the detriment 
of our future generations and their welfare. So this undermining of social welfare, Sri Lanka, as I mentioned in my last lecture in the 1970s was considered a development model, not because of high per capita incomes, in fact, very low per capita incomes. This is when Sri Lanka was still a low income country, but because while having low incomes, it had extremely high human development indicators. Sri Lanka, along with Cuba and the Indian state of Kerala were considered uh, development models for this reason that despite lower uh, per capita incomes, they had very high human development indicators. And that is what is at risk now with the um, undermining of our social welfare system and possibly a wave of privatization. And, the, and of course the IMF, the World Bank uh, and the economic establishment have their uh, response to that. And they say, oh, you know, we are not the IMF of the 1980s. This is the reformed IMF, you know, the cuddly teddy bear that all of you should come and hug because now the IMF is ready to provide uh, social protection along with its um, uh, uh, austerity policies that there will be targeted social protection measures to ensure that those in poverty are taken uh, care of. Uh, the UN agencies and even the World Bank and the ADP are saying they're repurposing uh, their projects towards humanitarian relief. But what is at stake even there, and, and uh, nothing has come in terms of uh, social protection uh, from the state. So that remains a myth up to this point, but, they, but uh, the neoliberal propagandists and Sri Lanka's neoliberal think tanks continue to say it's coming, it's coming, while it's been a year since people have been suffering. But beyond that, what those targeted social protection measures mean is undermining of universal social welfare built over decades. So they are also seeing this as an opportunity to undermine um, the, the, the infrastructure of social welfare built over seven decades and which has uh, been the boon of uh, support from the state for the citizenry of Sri Lanka. Instead, um, they want to, as I mentioned in my uh, last lecture, in the 1970s, we had free education, free healthcare, and a universal food subsidy. The universal food subsidy was made into a targeted food subsidy, then a targeted cash transfer. And now that is reduced to uh, something on the order of 10 US dollars a month per family. Or even if you are a large family uh, or household of five or six, hardly 20 US dollars a month. So this is the, the myth of uh, social protection with targeted measures and cash transfers. But uh, Sri Lanka is flooded with that rhetoric as the solution to the suffering caused by austerity measures. We are seeing some amount of humanitarian supplies coming into uh, Sri Lanka, in, including uh, to the post war North and Jaffna, where I live, where people uh, have been, been devastated by two and a half decades of war, are now again being devastated by this economic crisis. But that humanitarian relief consists of importing fortified rice from Australia, from the United States, from India and China. Rice is something Sri Lanka was self-sufficient in. When they import rice as a humanitarian measure, what it does is it disrupts the local uh, agricultural uh, production. Farmers are now abandoning 
agriculture and it's going to be much harder to get them to produce. So even these humanitarian measures are not seeking to uh, increase local production. Much of Sri Lanka's population is rural and dependent on such rural incomes. So on the one hand, they're discouraging local production while providing them humanitarian relief. Are these, you know, the, the other question is, are these measures, are they going to have humanitarian relief year on year if this crisis is going to last five, 10 years? There is, and, 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 and this is the sort of uh, shock doctrine of humanitarian relief that also Sri Lanka is being subject to without any uh, plan. Um, and countries in debt crisis uh, that, are, that are particularly defaulted cannot even work towards a different economic model. That's what we need. We need to rethink the economic trajectory that we've come. We need a different economic trajectory to make this sustainable. But the option of a different economic model is denied because we are beholden to the IMF to be able to normalize our external relations, particularly because what I said earlier, Sri Lanka prematurely defaulted on its debt. And in a way that was the insidious rationale of Sri Lanka's economic elite and possibly many of its international advisors and global powers that were advising Sri Lanka during that moment. And I mean, I think uh, it's too early to say, probably uh, researchers in the future, including those who do research on history and, and, and can dig into the diplomatic archives might be able to find out who gained from Sri Lanka's premature default, which countries lost out and, and which countries gained. India gave a $4 billion credit line, but that credit line is not part of debt restructure. There's an exemption for it. The United States hardly provides any loans to Sri Lanka. So the geopolitics of that premature default will also have to be looked into in the future. Um, and in this context where we cannot uh, change our uh, economic model, what the, the likely uh, scenario is continuing uh, cycles of crisis. Uh, we might be knocking on the doors of the IMF even if this IMF agreement is agreed to in the, in the months ahead, two, three years down the line, we might be going for another IMF agreement as we've seen in Argentina and, and so many other countries. And we might be defaulting again, even if a debt restructuring uh, succeeds this time, pushing Sri Lanka into crises after crises because of the pressures and the unwillingness to pursue a different economic development model. Um, and I will end with just some few comments on uh, the way forward. Um, the, the market, which is seen as the solution, does not work amidst a crisis. There is tremendous uh, volatility and along with that instability, um, even at a local level, hoarding by traders, rent seeking by importers and exporters, all of this are what happens during a crisis. So if the market fails, even in normal times, it's going to be hugely volatile and, and subject to further failures and rent seeking during a crisis like this. Uh, I encourage you to think about uh, Hyman Minsky's uh, financial instability hypothesis that this kind of a debt crisis, along with financialization, endogenously also generates further financial crises. So unless we are willing to uh, push back on financialization, uh, what we have seen as an external crisis can 
uh, explode into a domestic banking crisis, a domestic financial crisis with further devastation of the economy. Uh, but uh, the recipe, the IMF recipe, and the way forward is continued uh, financialization, not addressing uh, the, 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 the path that we have come on with, with the neoliberal path over the last four and a half decades. So how do we address the debt overhang if there won't be debt cancellation? I think the, the only way forward is a wealth tax. And while the government is talking about uh, raising income taxes, uh, during a crisis when the flow of incomes are declining, that becomes that much harder. We'll have to go after the stock of wealth and only a, a wealth tax would be possible. I think the work of uh, uh, Barry Eichengreen on how even the Western world had to consider uh, such a capital levy during the interwar period uh, after the First World War uh, due to the huge amount of uh, debt overhang uh, due to uh, uh, wartime expenditure it, it is something that we can draw on uh, to think about. Um, a recent uh, working paper uh, by uh, three economists uh, out of Harvard and uh, Paris, including uh, Danny uh, Roderick, uh, Ishak Divan, and uh, Reza Bar, the former uh, uh, Central Bank Governor of Pakistan, is uh, has some interesting uh, ideas about addressing the, and, and the importance of addressing the debt overhang and thinking about a different. Uh, economic model, I would go much further than that in terms of the drastic changes to the, the economic development model that we should consider. In the case of Sri Lanka, uh, given the proportion of this crisis where we are facing a food crisis, uh, food system is in disarray, agricultural production is in disarray, we really have to consider rebuilding our public distribution system. In the 1970s, we had a robust public distribution system um, with, for example, to be able to purchase local uh, goods with um, the paddy marketing board, to be able to purchase rice and paddy locally, uh, the food commissioner's department, the cooperative wholesale establishment, and a countrywide network of multi-purpose uh, cooperative societies through which we were able to address the the economic crisis and the food crisis of the 1970s. But with the turn to neoliberal policies, that public distribution system was dismantled. And we would have to rapidly uh, rebuild that and focus on agriculture and the food system. We would also have to uh, increase aggregate demand through deficit spending because of the fact that the, the economy is in free fall. The, the severity of a 10% contraction of the economy, uh, nobody's talking about in Sri Lanka. Uh, neither our donors, uh, nor our economic uh, establishment. Uh, the only thing they seem to be concerned, as I mentioned in my last lecture, is inflation. And it, this is not uh, really inflation. These are price hikes caused by the uh, massive depreciation of the rupee and increase in commodities in the global commodity markets. Um, but increasing aggregate demand through deficit spending would you know, run counter to the primary surplus demand of uh, the IMF. Um, we would have to prioritize imports and reconfigure the external sector. But again, I, as I mentioned, there's a huge amount of pressure both from uh, the international financial institutions, including the IMF and uh, uh, the Western powers uh, in insisting that Sri Lanka remain committed to the free trade regime. Uh, An economic um, model is needed, a new development economic model is needed, and that needs to now rethink uh, 
domestic uh, economic relations, the relationship between the urban and rural uh, sectors, the kind of spending that would be necessary to be able to uh, create uh, increased uh, demand. And a neglected question here, as I mentioned last time as well, is the agrarian question. Uh, land is one of the few resources at the disposal of uh, the uh, state to be able to reactivate local uh, livelihoods. But both in Sri Lanka and internationally amidst this debt crisis, there is very little discussion um, of the agrarian question along with this uh, debt crisis. And then we really need to rethink what development financing is going to look like uh, for not only Sri Lanka, but much of the development world going forward. The foreign direct investment and, and the export led model, which was promoted has completely failed. And to the point where foreign direct investment in countries like Sri Lanka was reduced to merely speculative investment in real estate. If you look at the data in Sri Lanka over the last decade, foreign direct investment flows were minimal and, and, and a majority of it, 78% um, was really speculative investment in real estate, in condominiums, in hotels and so on, not productive investment leading to uh, exports. So we need to, uh, we need development financing uh, and, but that has to be ring fenced to develop agriculture, local uh, production, and uh, targeted exports. But we have to take the whole idea of self-sufficiency much more seriously. Interestingly, uh, John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s uh, even argued for self-sufficiency amidst the Great Depression. And during this, time of depression in Sri Lanka and, and possibly uh, the spread of such an economic depression in other parts of the global South, we are going to have to take the idea of self-sufficiency much more seriously and self-sufficiency, especially in terms of essential goods and uh, food, because in a country like Sri Lanka, we're also looking at the prospect of starvation if not uh, famine. And in all of this, again, I repeat, Sri Lanka is not an island, but what kind of external relations are we going to look at? I think South-South uh, cooperation in the future is crucial, um, but many of our countries in the global South and our elite, they are firmly committed to financialization and the neoliberal path of development. So unless there is the political change in our countries where we think in terms of South-South uh, cooperation, possibly delinking, I think the work of uh, Samir Amin is extremely important now to again uh, rethink the path that we need um, for uh, economic development in our countries with meaningful uh, development financing and sustainable trade. Uh, the kind of trade regime, the free trade regime is uh, among its other extractive and exploitative characters, it is also not uh, sustainable. Um, but for all of this, countries like Sri Lanka would first have to get out of the IMF trap. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. It was really very informative and provided a lot of insights to all of us. We may now take comments and questions. So the audience is requested to please raise their hand or write their comments in the chat box.
we can perhaps give the students a couple of minutes to frame their questions and comments while you can take a break for some time, Professor. It has been an intense one hour and more than an hour of lecture. We have a hand up from Focus Global. Yes, please introduce yourself yeah, and yeah, pose your question. Yeah, thank you, Professor. My name is Benny Kurvila. I work with a research organization called Focus on the Global South. So I'm not a student, but I thought your lecture was very enlightening. I just wanted to ask you to elaborate on the point that you made about the importance of the agrarian question, of resolving the agrarian question in Sri Lanka as part of you know, economic restructuring. Uh, in terms of the demands of the farmers' movements, in terms of progressive researchers, uh, what are the demands in terms of you know, questions around land reform, around production, around global trade. Like you said, Sri Lanka is not an island. It needs to import some goods. It could export. Uh, it needs to maybe invest in, you know, uh, value addition and agro-processing. So if you could just elaborate a bit on the alternative pathways uh, on agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Benny. That's a very important question. I think we'll take a few questions and uh, and then I'll come back uh, to that. I think that's a really important question. We have one more. Yeah. May I can? Yes, yes, Omar. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Professor, uh, this lecture was very interesting. Uh, uh, at last, he was talking about the self-sufficiency. So, I was wondering to know uh, that... Uh, the is it uh, how this self self sufficiency phenomena and yeah so how this self sufficiency phenomena will work for this uh, these uh, south asian countries like And we are uh, countries basically related with each other uh, and also dependent for their, uh, like, in terms of exports and imports, in terms of like petroleum, oil, and all. Um, most of the countries are dependent on other countries. So, so uh, what is your thought regarding that, that? How self sufficiency will work and how we can approach uh, this phenomena in a way? Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Okay, maybe I'll start with uh, uh, these two uh, questions and hopefully um, there will be other questions, but I also welcome uh, comments. It doesn't have to be just uh, questions. Uh, I would also be interested in your thoughts, I think, because many of these issues need to uh, think together. Um, I think both questions, actually, Benny's question 
and Uma's question are, uh, in my view, uh, related. Um, I mean, I haven't seen uh, much written on the agrarian question in relation to the debt crisis. So that, that, that's why I've been pushing that as an agenda. I would even say that, you know, this is a challenge that maybe the ideas network organizations like um, Focus on Global South and others uh, should uh, take up because in our countries, you know, within Sri Lanka, um, uh, one of my comrades, uh, Hashim Rashid from Pakistan, which is also now going through a similar debt crisis, um, uh, you know, very similar kinds of concerns because if you look at during the period of uh, the neoliberal era, uh, as I mentioned in my last lecture, Sri Lanka was the first country in um, South Asia to liberalize its economy and take the neoliberal turn. And in Sri Lanka, if you look at it over the last four and a half decades, there's been a steady decline in the government allocation, the percentage of the budget for agriculture. Right, and there, it was this whole focus on uh, export-led growth, and even within agriculture, um, uh, I think Ursa Patnaik has made this uh, point over and over again. Even in agriculture, we've been pushed towards cash production, towards um, uh, cash crop production towards exports, right? Not for our self-sufficient needs. So, and at this time of economic crisis and with the debt overhang, when we don't have even foreign exchange for imports, it's extremely important that we think about uh, the agrarian question, right? I'll, I'll, I'll give, I think, uh, three very concrete examples so, uh, you know, to, to kind of address um, Ben's question and to some extent Omar's as well. When, when we say agriculture, the agriculture sector includes the crop sector, uh, it includes uh, livestock, it includes fisheries, right? And if you take uh, these three uh, sectors, you take fisheries in Sri Lanka, uh, we are an island surrounded by sea, we have a long tradition of fishing. But over the last four and a half decades, we were pushed to get into seafood exports, high value seafood exports. So if you look at the 2010s, um, we earned about 200 to 250 million US dollars from seafood exports, high species, uh, high value species of seafood. Blue swimming crab, uh, sea cucumber, uh, various uh, shrimp varieties, and so on. And uh, all the development programs, whether by the UNDP, the ILO, pushed our fish of pork, and I do also uh, considerable research on the rural economy, uh, pushed our fish of pork uh, to get into this uh, high species seafood uh, production. So we're getting 200, 250 million US dollars of export revenue. During the same period, if you look at our import bill, on the average, we were importing 200 million US dollars of seafood. We are an island nation, ridiculous. We were importing 200 million US dollars worth of seafood. What is worse is that the seafood we were importing, whether it's dry fish, sprats, moldy fish, this is what is significant for the animal protein of our population. When you look at it in, in nutrition terms, about 70% of our uh, protein comes from, animal protein comes from seafood, and we depend on that. Now we are in a crisis. We are unable to import that low value, but high quantity seafood necessary for our nutrition. If you take dairy, we are only 40% self-sufficient in milk foods in Sri Lanka. The rest of it, 
mainly in the form of milk powder, is imported from New Zealand, from Fonterra. And now we are unable to. Milk powder, which is less nutritious than fresh milk or pasteurized milk, there's a huge campaign to move towards that. And we neglected our dairy sector. If we look at uh, various other uh, vegetables, as I mentioned last time, with trade liberalization, there's also agricultural trade liberalization uh, with the neoliberal turn in the late 1970s. And we constantly import uh, various vegetables with in, from India or Pakistan. And, and then the scale of production here, we are never going to be able to compete. And worse, during harvest time when they import those goods, our farmers get uh, hammered. And, and now we are, we are in this quandary of this hugely bloated import bill because we are not self-sufficient. So when I say the agrarian question, the land question is also important. Um, our plantation economy, the plantations in tea and rubber and coconuts, uh, they are on their decline. What does it mean for a large community who were brought over as indentured labor from India? And this year marks the 200th year anniversary of um, the arrival of what we call the Hill Country Tamils, who are the most exploited community in our country, who had then disenfranchised that independence and continue to be exploited. Land was never uh, provided to them. So the land question is crucial, but it's broader than that. You know, what do we do about input markets? Uh, what do we do about fuel and fertilizer? If you look at the, one of the IMF demands, which I mentioned last time, is market pricing energy. Kerosene oil, which our small scale fishers use, in the last year, the price has quadrupled And it makes it uh, unsustainable. You cannot just allow rural livelihoods to be subject to the vagaries of the global market. And prioritizing imports and prioritizing subsidies or stabilizing input markets is critical to, uh, for the agrarian uh, world. Then, what possibilities do we have for industries? I would say Sri Lanka needs to again start with agricultural industries. Um, the other hat I wear is as chair of the Northern Cooperative Development Bank, which is uh, a federation of all cooperatives in the Northern province of Sri Lanka, the Wartan Northern province, 1,200 uh, uh, cooperatives. And um, amidst this crisis, we continue to focus on agricultural production, but also agricultural industries and value addition as a way forward. But there is no national program. Uh, the state is completely blind to the cooperatives and the agrarian question, and there's very little discussion of it uh, internationally as well. But this is, you know, uh, my my uh, my suggestion is that we should really focus on this. Uh, two years ago, um, Millennial Asia, the journal, had a special issue on agrarian markets in uh, South Asia, um, and um, it was uh, co-edited by Professor Sukhpal Singh and Professor Barbara Harris uh, White, and it 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 came out also because of the uh, uh, farmers struggle in India, uh, but uh, Hashim Rashid Ahmad Shah from India and I have a co-authored piece on agricultural markets in uh, South Asia where we touch on uh, some of these issues and I'll be happy to uh, forward you uh, that article. Um, and to Omar's question about uh, Self-sufficiency. No, certainly we are not an island. 
we have to import fertilizers, fuel, and so on. Uh, there might be some agroecological possibilities as well, but that's a very long, slow uh, transition. When Cuba went through the shock of uh, continuing sanctions after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, they had to deal with the agrarian question and, uh, and they made some progress through uh, agroecological initiatives. So they don't have to rethink all of that. Uh, in terms of production, but um, self-sufficiency as an idea and as uh, a concept, I think has to be delved into much more. Um, Devaka Gunavardhana and I, two years ago in the International Quarterly of Asian Studies, wrote a paper on the long 1960s in uh, Sri Lanka, when Sri Lanka went through the 1960s and 1970s import substitution and a different economic model. So we reviewed that economic model and uh, the reasons for its failure. But one of the positive things of those efforts then was the emergence of this idea of uh, self-sufficiency. And I think it, it has to begin with uh, the agrarian question and uh, with the rural economy, but it has, uh, it should be thought of in national uh, proportions as well. So again, when it comes to fuel and fertilizers and so on, it, it, it's prioritizing imports. It's uh, thinking about the kind of subsidies or stabilization of input uh, market prices to be able to make it, um, make uh, agricultural production and self-sufficiency um, sustainable. But we threw all that out with the uh, uh, neoliberal uh, trade regime uh, and with, uh, with the WTO. So now we're going to have to go back to the drawing board. Thank you. Jonathan has written in the chat box, Professor, he says, how is it that in the whole debt restructuring discourse in which bondholders are taking severe and punishing haircuts, the question of stolen wealth is not a priority on the table. According to the UN Economic Commission for Africa, money illegally transferred across borders in addition to aggressive tax avoidance amounts to a loss of $100 billion annually for African states including Ghana. How come this is not high on the table in the debt restructuring discussion? Yeah, in, in uh, Sri Lanka as well, um, uh, Jonathan, uh, there is a emerging uh, a discussion and a debate and a demand uh, about uh, the non-repatriation of uh, uh, export earnings, including uh, retained uh, earnings and um, uh, measures uh, to either bring back that those uh, uh, that capital park outside uh, and to put in place uh, measures to ensure that there is that kind of uh, flight of uh, capital. Um, I think uh, that needs to be, uh, continue to be uh, pursued um, and um, measures put in place, you know, how uh, realistic and feasible it will be to bring back uh, such funds uh, parked abroad to address the current debt crisis is, uh, is a question, but uh, it's certainly an important point in terms of what uh, the corporates and the super rich in countries like us are doing. Uh, in, in other words, not only uh, a lot of the hard-earned uh, wealth of our working people, in the case of Sri Lanka, it's uh, a lot of it is earned as a gender aspect to it by women working in the tea plantations as uh, tea pluckers, women working in the, in the garment sector, women going abroad and working as uh, domestic uh, workers. 
Um, but all that wealth has either been used as uh, for conspicuous uh, consumption. Uh, what we also saw in Sri Lanka over the last 12 years, the huge number of luxury vehicles and condominiums and with their fittings and all that imported with the hard earned earnings while Sri Lanka then defaults. And then also large amount of funds uh, being uh, parked abroad. So there, there is a, a, a class question, uh, I think at the heart of this, but along with calling and pointing out this corruption, we have to think about what kind of redistributive measures can be brought about uh, to reckon with such uh, flight. So, and, and that's where I think the idea of a wealth tax uh, targeting the wealthy and the super rich and uh, export earning firms would be important. The discussion around this would be an important step in that direction. Yeah, Jonathan, I was just uh, answering your uh, question, and I know you lost connectivity. I was just briefly saying that um, in Sri Lanka also this discussion has been taken forward by uh, some economists and trade unions. Um, it's, it's linked to what's happened to our foreign pardon, foreign earnings of the working people that it either has been used as conspicuous consumption in luxury vehicles and, and uh, so on, or it has also led to being parked abroad. Um, but so we need to take that forward through uh, as a class question for redistribution, where um, a wealth tax would be one way to uh, target those uh, who would have been part of uh, such. Uh, uh, illegal and uh, or measures of parking their uh, foreign earnings and return their earnings abroad. Thank you, Professor. It seems we have this we have only these responses so if there are no more comments we can close this session now okay thank you very much professor for delivering these two lectures and sharing your analysis on this topic, which is crucial not only for Sri Lanka, but many other developing countries. And we look forward to having more sessions with you in the future. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for participating and joining us today. Uh, thank you uh, again, uh, Ankur, for organizing this and for Ideas Network for inviting me. It was a um, great honor and a pleasure. I, I look forward to uh, engaging with you in the future and, and I'm happy to communicate uh, with the students of this Ideas Networks Advanced uh, Certificate on uh, Research and Political Economy course. If they are you know, they're free to email me if they have any questions or would like references that uh, of articles that I mentioned, I'm happy to communicate with them um, by email as well. And, 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 and good luck to all of you as you uh, pursue your uh, academic and uh, research interests. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I will share your email with the students if they need to communicate with you. Thank you very much. Bye.